Hello, and here comes another video about Charlie Plexing. A while ago, I bought these LED blocks, which can be used as uh, battery charge indicators. They look like a battery symbol, and they contain 10 LEDs, which are connected between the pins down here, so we can just see if we test, take this tester here. Here we have a red one, there's a couple of red ones. On the other side for the last uh, bit there's actually a blue LED. Um, but if I wanted to use these on an ATmega or an Arduino of any kind, uh, directly then I would need 10 GPL pins to actually control these LEDs. So the idea was then to do Charlie Plexing again as in one previous video here and for that I prepared a sketch or a, a drawing in KiCad today where actually you see the 10 LEDs here and I paired them up in anti-parallel pairs for Charlie Plexing and uh, with just four pins we then can actually control up to 12 LEDs, four times three, but in our case we only need 10 so one of the possible pairs is not here. But uh, if, you just, if you just go and walk through here from uh, pin number one, current can flow through this LED to pin number two. Um, it can flow in the opposite direction from two to one. It can flow from one to three and it can flow from three to one and it can go from one to four and from 4 to 1 and then it can go from pin number 2 through this LED to pin number 3 and from pin number 3 back through this LED to pin number 2 and from pin number 2 to pin number 4 and back from pin number 4 to pin number 2. So the pair which I didn't connect would then be the last pair which would be between pins 3 and 4 if we had 12 LEDs to control. But we, we only have 10 LEDs to control here. So um, going from the schematic, uh, I sketched up a circuit board here and wait a second, yeah like this. So I cheated a bit uh, because, well, I wanted to have a circuit board layout where I still have LEDs as symbols. So I used a LED package with 7.62 millimeters between the pins here. And then I drew all the 10 LEDs parallel like this. So the 3D view looks a bit odd with this standard diode packages here um, but instead just figure that it would be this block of LEDs here on, on the same place. So it's it's a standard DIL package so it's 7.62 millimeters between the two rows of 10 pins each and uh, then oops then we have four connection points here for the four outgoing wires and it's a single-sided layout which was a bit tricky so there is actually one solder bridge here a wire which goes on the other side so the next uh, thing then was to actually today quickly make these circuit boards so um I used a toner trans transfer process. Well, perhaps before going into these photos, I put together a uh, layout here um, with a couple of these. This is on regular printer paper, and this is with the laser printer printed on inkjet photo paper. 
and uh, here I cut out two of the layouts. I had to use one full sheet of paper anyway, so I filled it up with it. I still have more of these uh, modules here. Perhaps at some point I will make more of these boards. I don't know yet. The uh, line width here is a bit on the small side, but I had to get in between the pads uh, without actually issuing a, a design rule check error. So it's 0.32 millimeter wide lines, which is a bit on the low edge for my uh, process, but actually everything worked out fine in the kitchen sink. So here you see the uh, circuit board cut out where I already wetted the photo paper in order to actually lift it off after I had laminated on the traces onto the circuit board. So here's a closer up view where also here we also start to see the mesh and, and we see actually the toner of the laser print adheres quite well to the copper of the circuit board. And going on here, almost all of the paper is removed by just rubbing it between fingers and with some water. And then I used a toothbrush to clean up the rest of the traces before then it looked like this and was ready to be etched. So here's my etch tank. This is an aquarium heater, which brings it up to, yeah, it's, it's not really 40 centigrades, but we are close to that. And uh, the solution is sodium uh, peroxodisulfate, so sodium sulfate or sodium persulfate, it's also known as. And this is already close to the end of the etching process. We see already the um, plain circuit board material showing through. There's some remainders of uh, copper left here. And a couple of minutes later, almost everything of the copper was gone. And it was time to take it out and clean it up. There was obviously an air bubble stuck here, but I don't care because uh, this is outside of our layout area anyway but I'm quite happy with the 0.32 millimeters. Here we see some damage to the tracks, but actually um, they are still complete. And so this was a complete success on both of these circuit boards. So then I removed the toner with acetone and uh, afterwards I hot tinned the circuit board with my soldering iron using uh, large amounts of flux. And so we have now the tin coated um, circuit board here. Then it was time to drill the holes. And uh, yeah, there were plenty of them, but it's not so bad. And uh, then here we see one of the two solder bridge wires. Here would be the second one. And uh, then actually it was time to put the LED module in. And here is the finished small module. Here's both of them. And uh, so this is where we are now, actually. Um, because here we have the module. And uh, so it was something from start to finish. It's half a day today. Um, but I did a lot of other things uh, besides just making these two small boards here. So now it's time to connect them and uh, get them to shine up. And this time I want to do the Charlie plexing with just an 80 mega 328 here. And let's see if I manage to. So what we need to do is to start Visual Studio Code and get ready with a new project for this thing here. Okay, so here we are in um, Visual Studio Code uh, with Platform I.O. And I start a new project. Um, let's call it 2022-0426 uh, Charlie Plex. Um, I add that it's for an M328, a microchip 80 mega. 
switch rate. And it's not for this platform here, it is for an 80 mega 328. And uh, for just an 80 mega 328, actually the one I have is a P, um, there's no real difference between the two. But I choose this one here. Um, yes, we have to choose the Arduino framework for actually creating the project, but I will get rid of it in a second here. So we are almost almost done here. Um, okay, still working on it, working on it, working on it. And here we are, and we are in the platform io.inify directly. And I want to replace all this with the settings which we have used in a previous video where I described how to use platform IO without Arduino. So um, this is actually the settings which are more in detail described in the other video. Um, right now I will be running it at 8 megahertz and not at 1 megahertz. Um, but this should be the correct settings and then we go in here and instead of a CPP file I want to actually have a C file. I can actually I guess just rename the file here into C and now we get rid of all of this and instead of Arduino I want to include the io.h from the main 80 mega toolchain or ABR toolchain. And uh, now I have to decide where to connect the LEDs. Um, let's have a look here. And so what we have on this chip is he up here is the reset pin. Then comes PD01234. Um, so five bits of port D, then comes P, B, six and seven, and then comes P, D, um, five, six, seven, P, B, zero, P, B, one and P, B, two. And here are the SPI connections from the programmer. And then up here we have the analog inputs and port C. So I plan to use four bits, the four lowest bits from port D for this quick test here now. So let's put the module here. And I have no idea right now, I don't care which of the LEDs is connected to which pin. Um, we will figure out this later. So I take a wire from PD0 to the first pin of the module from here to the second, um, PD goes to this, and the last PD3 here goes to the fourth pin of the module. So we have our LEDs, our, our four pins of our Charlie Plexing input here now connected to PD0 to PD3. Going back to our code, um, let's just try to light up one of these LEDs to see if anything works at all. So for this we need a main function. We let, Let's say we test with the LED, with any LED which is connected between PD0 and PD1. So I need to define those two as outputs. And I write down the port bits here as binaries. So this would make PD0 and PD1 outputs. And uh, then I set port D to 0B, 1, 2, 3, 4, I have here, well, that was 1, 0 to few, so like this. 
lining app makes things clearer. So now I choose PD0 as anode and PD1 as cathode. And uh, then I make a while one doing nothing here so that we are kept here. So this should light up one LED hopefully on this module here if there's an LED connected between. I, I, sh I should test this. I, I, I should actually test it uh, beforehand if there is any LED between these two pins. Let's do this quickly. Um, so this, this, since both modules are the same I can test it on this module here. And let's see if, the, oh yeah, there, there is a blue LED um, in this direction and there's a green LED. It's very hard to see on the camera that it's actually green, but it is, this is green and it's not hard to see, but it, it's not the best, it, it's a bit overexposed. Um, but so this is green and this is blue. So. I would expect with positive on PD0 and negative on PD1 to see a green LED light up like this. Let's see if that works. Um, we go back to our code here and we actually compile and then we do an upload. Let me make this window down here a little bit bigger and we try to compile it. You don't have to do it separately, but I just want to see that everything else is set correctly. And uh, yes, so we are not using any data memory and we are using 142 bytes for, for this piece of code here. And let's try to upload it using the programmer. And well, I should have actually switched you over here. Um, I can actually try to dim down a bit with the aperture up here. So yes, we have a green LED on, um, on the second position. And uh, well, now, now we want to of course see that we can control all 10 of these LEDs. So in order to do so, we have to do some changes in our code and I will define a, an array which allows me to control the 10 LEDs. Um, I, I will randomly actually mix it together. So, so it, it, or not so randomly, but the LEDs will light up randomly. So I define one array, which gives me the data directions. Um, directions for the LEDs and well I define it for all the 12 even though we only use 10 of the LEDs and uh, we have to put some values in here so uh, we end it with a semicolon here I can actually define it as a static const it could be going into the program memory, but I mean, we're talking about 12 bytes of, for both of these arrays here now. So it's not really a big thing. And uh, well, let's start. Uh, so for the data directions, um, we can have a look as one example. So here we have the data directions for the first pair um, where we need these two pins as outputs. So I will actually copy this directly like this. Um, this is our first and the second one will be the same, but it will be connected in the opposite direction. Then we have another pair between pins zero and two. We have another pair, whoops, zero B zero zero between three and zero. We have another pair between 
these two. Zero B one one zero. And we have another pair between uh, these two. Oops. And uh, if I count correctly, we have one pair left now, which would be the pair which is connected between pin three and four. Or no, sorry, pin two. PD2 and PD3. Um, so it would be like this. So these are the settings for the data direction in order to control the LEDs, the 12 possible LEDs in the six anti parallel pairs on four GPIO pins. And uh, now I have to define another array static const u int 8 type and let's call it control. And also here we start with the first pair. Like this, making PD zero anode and PD one cathode. The opposite would look like this PD one at cathode, now oh, PD zero at as cathode and PD1 as anode. I probably should line them up in the other direction. Um, it's just comments, but it might be more readable like this. So this is the other direction of the two. And now we copy and we have this pair here between PD1 and PD2. Let's scroll back. The next pair is between PD3 and PD0. Then we have another pair. So this was this one here. Then we have PD2 and P PD1 and PD2. PD1, PD2 and PD2, PD1. So how does this look in binaries? It would be, no, it would be the opposite. It would be one zero here. So this will be the high, the end node, and here this will be the end node. And uh, then we go and take another pair. So now we are here. So it would be meaning that we have to move this one position over. And now we have the pair PD1, PD3, and PD3, PD one. Then the next one, so PD3, PD1. Are we already there? Two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Yeah, it's already the last one here. And uh, so that is this pair, um, which means that we have a one here. Zero there. Some, something is wrong here. It should be like this. Um, and this. So here we have PD2 as an anode and PD3 as cathode. And we have PD3 as anode and PD2 as cathode. So now 
by sequentially setting these values for the data direction and these values for the port value, I should be able to go through all the LED patterns which we have. So instead of having it like this, I will actually move, I can remove this. I will define a variable uint eight type i equals zero and uh, uh, of course a semicolon is always nice to have in c and uh, then we will set ddrd to the indexed value of our directions field directions i and port d we will set to the value of control i semicolon and now it would be nice to wait um, before we go to the next one uh, so that we can distinctively see what's happening and for this i will use the standard include standard library um, util delay.h which gives us millisecond and microsecond delays. Um, I will use a millisecond delay. Let's wait. It's, it's only 10 LEDs so we can wait a full second here to start with. Then we will have I++ and we have to make sure that we only go through 12 values here. By the way, I forgot to give this information here. Here I had it. Um, so I++ and I modulo 12 to bring it into the range of 0 to 11. And, uh, well, I think that should be it. We compile the code here first and see if, no, everything seems fine. Um, yes, we are actually now using 24 bytes, our two global variable arrays here of 12 bytes each, 1.2% um, of the RAM memory and uh, 260 bytes of code memory. And let's have a look what this can do. So I switch you over here and I will upload the code. Um, and here we are. And, well, um, something weird happens for the last pair where there's no LEDs connected, as you have seen. Um, actually, we have some lighting up of uh, different other combinations and this is because the 5 volts of the supply here are enough to get current through two series connected LEDs um, when there's nothing else in the way, which clamps the voltage. So let's actually get them to shine in the correct order um, and to get rid of the last pair. So we go back here. The last pair is obviously the last pair in our list here because it is was the last one which showed up there. I could have left the definition in here for further future use. Um, well, I don't think that's necessary. And uh, now it was that it went second LED from the right, first LED from the right, then comes fourth and third and so on. So if I want to actually bring them in at least one sequential order in that direction, I have to swap the pairs here, control X, control V, control X, Control V, Control X, Control V, Control X, 
control v control x control v um, let's see what this brings oh and i have to now change this to 10 we have only 10 pairs of led or 10 leds left let's get you over here and uh, compile and upload the new code so these leds here you can see when they're flashing then actually we're uploading the code and here we now have a controlled sequence of all the 10 leds individually lit up through four gpio pins um it might be even more interesting or in yeah I, I i think i want to order them in the opposite direction now um so i will have to turn over this list here um let's see how this can be most easily done i take this one here and put it under i take this one here and put it under this one here, put it lowest. This one here comes next. 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 And last one, or first one from the old list will be the last one. And of course, now I have to also rearrange these uh, numbers here into the right sequence so that pairs get where they belong together again. Um, we do it the same way. Oops, like this goes under here. This goes here, this goes here, and this goes here. So now this should have reversed the order in which the LEDs light up. Um, we go over here, so I will compile and upload the new code. and. Uh, we see what happens and yeah now we are going in direction from left to right from red over yellow to green and finally blue here red red yellow 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 green 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 and blue So the idea in, in the project I'm working on will be to actually not only light up one of these bars, but several bars at a time by actually doing some time multiplexing. And, uh, well, I think uh, for this video, this is so enough because now you have seen how we can control these individual LEDs in a Charlie Plexing with four wires. A small addendum I couldn't let it be and so here we now have the display the full display um, where we actually can see that uh, we can show essentially whatever we want on this display so let me just quickly show you the code behind the scenes and the necessary additions which I did um, I included the interrupt library avr slash interrupt.h i defined a global variable representing the value um, which is to be shown here where a value of zero means all the leds are off a value of one is like this this is value two value three four five six seven eight nine and ten and uh, then we now have an interrupt service routine and in this interrupt service routine which is on the timer zero overflow vector so whenever timer zero runs over we are jumping into this routine 
It has an internal counter i, which replaces our counter in the main routine from before. I switch off everything, which is possibly on from the last visit in this routine, and then increment our counter and keep it within its bounds from 0 to 9. And if the global variable value here has a value which is larger than the current uh, value of i, that means that we want to have the LED on. And uh, then we are actually updating the port D and the DDRD with the corresponding values from our tables here. And uh, then we leave our interrupt service routine and uh, after, with the next interrupt we get back in here and go through it again. So in main I start by initializing the timer. And the timer is running at mode 0, which means that it counts from 0 to 255 and then starts over at 0 while at the same time issuing an interrupt. And uh, I have chosen a clock prescaler of 8. So our timer will run now at the 8 MHz CPU clock frequency divided by 8. So it will step up in microsecond steps. And after 8 microseconds, or after 255 microseconds, or 1256 microseconds to be exact, our timer will overflow and uh, then restart. I enable the interrupt, overflow interrupt in the timer and I enable the global interrupts in the 80 mega. And in our while routine, I just change the value of the global variable um, value. Um, I should probably declare this variable here as volatile because we are using it from both the within the interrupt service routine and from within the main code even though it seems to work without this declaration um, let's see it, it's more critical if we change a variable in an interrupt service routine then we definitely have to use volatile so it still works and here we have a display of an increasing charge in our battery.